Yeah, so um, thank you everyone who's joining. Thank you so much, Eva, once again, for, um, for coming to speak with us virtually here in Bristol. Um, just a little introduction for everyone in the talk to Eva. Um, Eva's a professor at the Cohen Institute for History and Philosophy of Science at Tel Aviv University. Um, Eva's done huge amounts of research on um, a lot of different topics, but um, just a few are evolutionary theory, genetics, epigenetics, and developmental biology. Um, she's published a huge amount throughout her career, but um, a few of her most recent books are Evolution in Four Dimensions in 2014, which was co-authored with Marion Lamb, um, The Evolution of the Sensitive Soul, Learning and the Origins of Consciousness, which was 2019 and co-authored with Simona Ginsberg, and um, just out a few months ago, uh, Picturing the Mind Through the Lens of Evolution, which again is co-authored with Simona Ginsberg. Um, we're very pleased to be joined today by Eva, and um, today she's going to be giving a talk titled The Goals and Functions of Consciousness. So I'll hand it over to you, Eva. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming to this lecture. What I'm going to talk about is really uh, about uh, the evolution of consciousness, which is a very big problem and one that didn't get very much attention for a very long time uh, for various reasons. I'm when I'm saying very long time, I'm talking about mainly 20th century. At the end of the 19th century, it actually was a hot topic. And at the, even at the beginning of the 20th century, it, it did interest people, but uh, there were for various reasons it disappeared for quite a long time. And it uh, again, after the, uh, the reintroduction of consciousness studies as a legitimate uh, discipline in uh, neurobiology and uh, in, uh, cognitive and in cognitive studies, uh, after some time, uh, it reappeared. The, the evolutionary approach reappeared. So I'm going to talk to you about the question whether, how should we think about consciousness, about the functions and goals of consciousness. People find it very, very difficult to think about the functions of consciousness. So before I start, I just want to thank my friends, my students and my colleagues for uh, their contribution, especially uh, Anna Zeligowski and Simona Ginsburg. Simona is the person with whom I was writing all this uh, stuff about uh, consciousness. Uh, she also is the one who sort of made me actually interested in that because I didn't want to touch this subject. I was afraid of it because I thought I, you know, I'll have nothing really original to say and so on. And she sort of started talking to me about it and then I got excited and that was it. <laughs> yeah. So, and I want to dedicate this talk to the memory of Marion Lamb who died five months ago of lung cancer. A great tragedy and loss for me personally and to science generally. Okay, uh, I, I want to I want to uh, to ask a question. Uh, how should we think about consciousness? Does consciousness has functions, or does it have function or functions, or does it have goal or goals? And the reason that I'm asking this question is that is that is because there is quite a lot of confusion in the literature when people are talking about uh, functions and about goals. They for various reasons, they, they mix them together. And sometimes when they, they, they talk sort of about purpose, when they talk about purpose, sometimes they talk about functions, sometimes they talk about goals and goals and functions are not exactly the same things. They very much depend on the frame uh, of reference uh, in which you are. It, this de de determines how you define consciousness, uh, how you define function and how you define goals. So I will start with, uh, uh, so after I, so this is the question I'm going to ask, how should we think about the function fun or, or goal of consciousness? Should we think in terms of function? Should we think in terms of goals? And what does it mean? What will it mean? So I will briefly uh, define some concepts in the way that I'm going to use them uh, during this lecture so that we have a kind of common ground, a common denominator. Then I will introduce an, the, uh, an Aristotelian approach to the soul, which is the dynamic organization of goal-directed living systems, as Aristotle understood it. And I will reframe it in terms of evolutionary transitions between what we call Simona and I modes of being. Uh, 
modes of being will be the, the living mode of being, the living sentient mode of being, and the living sentient reflective mode of being, which is the human mode of being. And then I will ask what this mode of being perspective actually problematizes. What assumptions are made when people talk about problems with the function of consciousness, if they think about consciousness as a mode of being, conscious organism. Okay, and then I will say, I will, I will say that in order to understand how to think about functions or goals of this mode of being, we have to, it, it will be very helpful to think in evolutionary terms and to study the transition to consciousness. It can help to uh, us answer the function question, function goal question. And so I will uh, introduce the evolutionary transition approach. I will identify what we call the evolutionary transition marker to consciousness, which will help us identify the processes, the processes that constitute consciousness, that build up the dynamic architecture that is the, the architecture of consciousness. And uh, that this will help us to, uh, to identify the constitutive processes and the functions of uh, this kind of architecture, of, of, of the parts that constitute this architecture. And I will end, end with some general con conclusions. This is the kind of, this is the plan of this lecture. So let us start with what I'm going to talk about. So what is a goal? Uh, when, we, when I talk about a goal, uh, I, it, goal is attributed to an object, a process or a state to which the system behavior is directed. And this goal that, uh, and this behavior satisfies an intrinsic system's value. Now, all these concepts here, as is, usual, as is common in, uh, in our field, are sort of referring to each other. So uh, I will define goal two. Goal-directed behavior is attributed to behaviors that lead to the attainment of goals. And agent, I'm using this term in the sense that uh, Samir Okasha is using it, is a dynamic, flexible system displaying unified, adaptive, goal-directed behavior. When I'm talking about values, I'm talking about intrinsic reinforcement, intrinsic reinforcement that guides goal attainment or non-attainment. Values can be phylogenetic, like maintenance of homeostasis and homeorases that supports survival and reproduction. They can be ontogenetic mental, like affective states, like uh, we want to avoid uh, states like pain and pleasure, which we want to attain or not attain. And they can be symbolic, like uh, we want to attain, we want, uh, we, we are driven by goals such as uh, uh, beauty and truth and justice. And of course, the biolog in biological organism, the ultimate value of uh, survival and reproduction constrains all as of over revolutionary time. It doesn't determine them, but it constrains them. Uh, when I'm talking about function, I'm talking about a function is not attributed to a system. It is attributed usually to a trait, a structure or a process that contributes to the goal-directed behavior of the encompassing system. Of course, it depends on how we define the system. So this is why there is so much confusion in, uh, around this. Goals and functions are, are relative to the delineation of a system. And functional information, I'm not going to talk much about it, but if I do, what I mean is any difference that makes a difference to the goal or directed behavior of a system. I hope this is clear to you. I mean, you are philosophers, so it's not very horrible. To, and I guess that you thought quite a lot about functions and goals and, uh, and values and goal-directed uh, behaviors. So I hope, but I hope that this is clear and I hope that these terms will are uh, can be some kind of common denominator that we all have. But if if you will, if uh, if I'm uh, assuming too much, you can you can stop me anytime. Okay, why why doesn't it work? Okay, so I'm going to talk about Aristotle and about I, I as I as I told you I'm using. Uh, we're using, when I'm saying I, I really mean we, which is Simona and myself, so sometimes I say I, sometimes I say we, but I always mean the two of us. We're using an Aristotelian scheme, 
And Aristotle used the term soul to describe the dynamic organization that we call, uh, that we, Simona and I call teleological mode of being. He characterized it as the principle of life, the cause and source of the living body. He said, it is the soul, it is the source of movement, it is the end, it is the essence of the whole living body. So in Aristotelian terms, if you're familiar with Aristotle, Aristotle was defining this, uh, the, the soul in terms of three of his four causes, in terms of the final cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, and the what we call the formal cause, the essence of the thing. And he always said that in living organisms, when we describe a living organism, the end is the same as the essence. So the Aristotelian uh, soul is not the uh, is not the theological soul, of course. It is a dynamic specifically embodied form, organization, that makes an entity teleological in the intrinsic sense. That is, it is having uh, internal goals that are not externally designed for it by something outside it, but are dynamically constructed by, by, by its own activity. And there are three major categories that he identified, uh, which are plant, beast, and men. These are the categories of soul, and they are hierarchically nested. This is what he wrote. So the, the important thing, so they're hierarchically nested in the sense that you cannot have the, uh, the kind of nutritive soul, the basic soul. Uh, you always need the basic soul. And if you have also a mental states, the, a, a kind of sensitive soul, then you have also, then it has to be built on or nested within the, nutri the, the basic nutritive one. And if you have a reflective one, you also, and you're immortal, you a human being, you also need uh, to be a sensitive soul. And so in, I'm, I'll just quote to, uh, cite to you what he wrote because he wrote very beautifully. Of the psychic powers above enumerated, some kinds of living things, as we have said, possess all, some less than all, others only one. Those we have mentioned are the nutritive, the appetitive, the sensory, the locomotive, and the power of thinking. Plants have none but the first, the nutritive. He was talking also about the reproductive, by the way. So he was talking nutritive reproductive, but that's in an, an, another bit of the same book. Uh, while, so plants have none but the first, the nutritive. While another order of, of living things has this plus the sensory. If any order of living things has the sensory, it must also have the appetitive. For appetitive is the, is the genus of which desire, passion, wish are the species. Lastly, certain living uh, beings, a small minority, possess calculation and thought, for among mortal beings, those which possess calculations have all the other powers above mentioned. So there are three types of uh, creature, uh, of teleological living systems in the world, according to Aristotle. Of course, he was a good biologist. He knew there are all kinds of gray areas between them. We won't go into a whole Aristotelian story, I'm simplifying a bit, but basically, these were the three categories he was talking about. And these three categories are very, very different from each other. One is living, and it is very different from anything that is non living, but it is not sentient, it's not feel, it doesn't feel. The other one is both living and feeling, and the third one is also self reflective. It can reflect about itself, it has something that we call metacognition. And this is only, as, as far as we know, it is only humans that have it. And these three, uh, three types of uh, goal-directed biological organization, we call them teleological modes, modes of being. They're characterized by the possession of distinct value system. The value system, an intrinsic reinforcement system that guide goal attainment or non-attainment. So the teleological modes of being refer to the living non-sentient mode of being of plants, for example, for Aristotle, the sentient mode of being of animals, and the rational symbolic human mode of being. And as I said, what, what make, dis, distinguishes them, the criterion he is using are value system. They, the different value system delineate new types of goals for each of this teleological mode of being. So the value system for the living organism, for just living is uh, survival and reproduction. And they, they, this is, th these are the values that drive everything. 
the, for, for the uh, sensitive soul, it is also the desires, appetites, the, and, uh, and aversions. And for, the, uh, and for uh, the reflective soul, it is symbolic values, right? the good, the beautiful, the, the true. And the dynamic system that implement this modes of being are agents. The agencies they display correspond, cor uh, correspond to their mode of being. Now, what is interesting about all these modes of being is that they all enable open-ended evolutionary processes, which are driven by different value systems. So for example, the, if we're thinking about living, we're thinking about genetic evolution, about Darwinian kind of uh, evolution or something like that. And when we're thinking about uh, the, senti uh, the sensitive soul, we're thinking about evolutionary processes that happen within the nervous system. Select exploration and selective stabilization processes that happen within the system and that can accumulate and can form very, very complex uh, maps, uh, 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 representations, and cognitive maps. And when we're thinking about uh, the reflective consciousness, we're, we can think about cultural evolution, open ended cultural evolution. Now, since these three modes of being are biological, they have evolved. And we call the evolutionary transitions to living, to subjective experiencing, and to symbolizing, rationalizing the teleological evolutionary transitions. And the question, so this is how we think about this kind, of, about the Aristotelian scheme. We reframe it in evolutionary terms, and not only in evolutionary terms, but in evolutionary transition terms, which is a particular way of thinking about of addressing evolutionary questions. So the question is, okay, this is how we think about it. Can we really talk about the function of a mode of being? Is it, does it make sense to think like that? So what, well, think about living, sorry. Think about living. Living clearly evolved. There was some kind of chemical evolution and something like a complex, uh, a, cup, a system of coupled of certain coupled reactions created something that we call a living being. But if we think about living, can we say that living has a function? It seems like a category mistake, right? Because <laughs> does living have a function? Living defines what functions are, in fact. Without living, it's very difficult to think about functions, except if you think about functions of an artifact that was made by a living creature. This is a secondary thing. So it seems like it is wrong to think about the function of living things, unless we think about the function of living things uh, within a system like Gaia, right? If we think about that, then living is part of a bigger system. And then we can think, yes, living has some kind of function. But other than that, it is clearly a category mistake. However, this is not the case with subjective experiencing because it evolved already within the, the context of living. And obviously it cannot undermine long-term evolutionarily a survival and reproduction. So, so maybe we can think about it in terms of function. And people have tried and found it very, very difficult. And what, ha what usually happens when you read the literature on function, you see that uh, the functions of consciousness are identified with the functions of cognitive processes, such as integrating information within and between modalities, ac accessing information, target and action selection, decision-making, self-monitoring, flexible learning, and so on. And a lot of people think that this doesn't really capture uh, consciousness, because they argue you can have a conscious robot, a, a robot that behaves, that has all these functions, and it is not conscious. So there's something that is missing. And the, and usually the the solutions to these things are there are four uh, uh, there are four attitudes or four ways of of answering the function problem of uh, of consciousness. In living organisms and non-living 
if not that we have an example of that, we don't have any example of non-living organisms that are conscious, but uh, people like to speculate, uh, to, to talk as if uh, this is obviously is going to happen tomorrow. So what are the, uh, what, how do people think about it? Some people say, look, consciousness has no function. It is a physical primitive and it is a separate aspect of existence. And uh, panpsychists and uh, dual, some dualists think like that. It just, you know, it just doesn't have a function. It's like uh, mass or uh, energy. We have mass, we have energy, we have, we have consciousness. Uh, the other answer is that uh, consciousness is actually identical to adaptive plasticity, and this is a primitive of life. And adaptive plasticity is function. So this is the attitude of biopsychists. So that's it. Being alive is the same as being, uh, as being conscious because all life requires, is based on, cannot be without adaptive plasticity and, there, and adaptive plasticity is consciousness, so that's it. Then there is the attitude that says, look, the whole notion of consciousness is an illusion. There's no such thing. All there is are neurobiological processes. And that's on, the only way we have to think about it. The whole question is a nonsense. And there is also the, uh, an answer that says that consciousness is an epiphenomenon and it really has no function. And that's something that, for example, uh, Huxley famously said a long time ago in the 19th century. So we disagree. We disagree with all this uh, kind of uh, uh, answers or propositions. And we think that they are based on assumptions that we question, that are not self-evident to us at least. The first thing is that even if all the cognitive processes that constitute consciousness can be implemented in robots that are not conscious, this does not imply that they are not sufficient for consciousness in living organisms. It just doesn't follow logically. So this is not an argument against, against the, the, the function of consciousness. Of course, it doesn't tell us what it is, but it's not something that demolishes the possibility of consciousness. This is something that Searle has said quite a long time ago, and he's absolutely right. The second is, why do we have to, for example, if we take the biopsychist uh, assumption that consciousness is the same as adaptive plasticity, why? This is, is you know, if, you, if you're looking at what they are arguing, it seems, it looks like it is an axiomatic kind of a proposition. And there are arguments against biopsychism. For example, an important argument is that it is absolutely not clear what being unconscious means for biopsychism. By the way, also the panpsychist cannot answer it very easily. So I don't know what an unconscious bacterium is. I know what a live bacterium is. I know what, what, a, a, I know what a dead bacterium is. I also know what uh, a bacterium is which, which is frozen in 190 uh, and 80 degree, minus uh, degrees Celsius is, but I don't know what an unconscious bacterium is. So if one assumes, if one takes the Aristotelian position that, uh, that actually says, look, there is something about the organization, the, the organizational dynamics of, uh, of some uh, living organism that is that is additional and more uh, uh, to, to, to the living, to the merely living condition, and more, it's, uh, it's more specific and it's more demanding, this architecture uh, will constitute, constitutes consciousness and the processes that constitute this, uh, uh, this architecture will have functions. So, if you take an Aristotelian position, you that you don't, of course, you do not accept the biopsychist uh, assumption, but the biopsychist uh, bio assumption has inherent problems. And the, and the answer to the people who say that it is an illusion or it is an epiphenomenon is that if we assume, and we don't have to assume, but if we assume that like living, which is constituted by several complex and coupled chemical processes like 
replication, membrane assembly, autocatalytic metabolic activity, and several others. If we assume that like living sentience too is constituted by cognitive neurological functional operations, then all the functions that we attribute to phenomenal consciousness can be attributed to this constitu constitu constituted cognitive operations. And if you take this, uh, this uh, uh, constitutive causal perspective, a whole, a brain or an immune, uh, a complex immune reaction, for example, is not an epiphenomenon of the parts and processes that constitute it, and nor is it an illusion. And similarly, it, it is uh, biological consciousness is not an epiphenomenon of its coupled uh, and interacting uh, parts and process. It is this dynamic. It is this dynamics. This is, of course, if you assume, as we do, and a lot of people do actually, that consciousness is constituted by certain processes. Although we don't identify, we don't know, and we don't understand all these processes. A lot, uh, we have a very long way to go. So, if so, let's go back to the, the question, can we say that consciousness, subjective experiencing, has a function? And if the function that we, uh, that, or functions that we talk about can be attributed to the processes that constitute subjective experiencing, then what are these functions? What are these processes? And in order to answer this question, we have to look at the evolutionary transition to consciousness, at what consciousness is. And we, since we take an evolutionary view, and we think it is a very useful view because if we're looking at the earliest form of or minimal consciousness, the most minimal consciousness that we can envisage, then we have a chance of identifying very basic processes that will be, that will apply to all conscious creatures. So how to go about it, how to go about a something so, about a, a transition to a new mode of being. Fortunately, so, uh, some people did that with respect to life. And we, adopt, uh, we adopted the methodology that was uh, developed and employed by a Hungarian, uh, a, a Hungarian chemist, theoretical chemist, uh, Thibaut Ganti, and also by Maynard Smith and Sutbury when they were studying the evolutionary origin of life. We applied the same methodology for the investigation of the origin of minimal consciousness. And as I will explain, in order to do that, we look for something that we call an evolutionary marker of the transition to consciousness. Now, what is an evolutionary marker, transition marker? It's a property that when we have an evidence of it, we have evidence that the major evolutionary transition in which we are interested have gone to completion. And the identification of this marker allows us to reverse engineer into the system that enables it. I will explain it. I know it's, uh, it's not very clear at the moment. So let's look at the case of life. What did he do? He started with saying, look, let's start with some kind of consensus. What will people, let's not try to define consciousness. Let's characterize it. Characterizing and defining is not the same. Let's characterize a minimal life. Let's list the properties that most people will agree that if we have jointly all these properties in a being that we find, let's say on Mars, then this being is, then most people, most scholars of the uh, will agree that this creature is conscious. And what are they? So he said, this is maintenance of a boundary, metabolism, stability over time, dynamic stability, information storage, regulation of the internal milieu, growth, reproduction, and irreversible disintegration, death. Now, so he had this. He also identified a single diagnostic capacity that once it is present, it requires that all the above characteristics, all this list that I mentioned before is in place. And the diagnostic capacity that marks the presence of a living system, he suggested, is something he uh, that uh, he, I don't think he called it that. I think uh, Minot Smith and Satmari called it that. Uh, it's unlimited heredity. 
And unlimited heredity is the capacity to form lineages that vary in open-ended ways from the initial system. So the number of possible different variants is vast. And so he identified it, it was unlimited heredity, and then he built a model, which he called a chemical. And you see it uh, on the uh, right-hand side at the bottom. And what you see is that, one, and this is some kind of polymer, never mind the details, I will not go into it. But the important thing is about, about this uh, unlimited heredity system, which is the marker, is that if you find something that looks like a structure that uh, suggests that this is, this is part of an unlimited heredity system, for example, if you find frozen long polymers like DNA or something like that on another planet, then you can reverse engineer from that to the system that enables such things to be synthesized, to exist, because this cannot be formed spontaneously. There's absolutely no chance at all that it can be formed spontaneously. So at the top, we see sort of reconstructing something like a protocell from frozen DNA by some kind of clever alien. And the idea of the transition marker is relatively simple. Yes, it's, uh, we see what we see here is we have a, the list of capacities, for example, the list of capacities that uh, Ganti, uh, that Ganti gave us for life. And we, and this list of capacities is sufficient for uh, deciding that a, particular, that a particular being is alive. So we de it defines a mode of being, the living mode of being, once you have this list of capacities. And we have a transition marker that, that requires that all this list is in place. Some capacity that requires that all this list of capacities that we enumerate is there. And because of that, this marker marks the presence of this mode of being, okay? Right, so let's see what, so we, what, so we decided let's take this uh, approach and let's try and work with it. Can we actually find in the literature on consciousness, the philosophical literature, philosophy of, I mean, philosophy of mind literature, the psychological literature, the cognitive science, uh, cognitive science literature, which overlaps a lot with the psychology, the neurobiology, all this, whatever. Can we find some kind of characterizations that, again, if we find a being that jointly has them all, has all of these characteristics, most people will say, look, there's quite a good possibility that it is conscious. We are not sure, but it's, it's a good possibility. And we can define, I will not do it, but we can define all these properties at different levels, at the behavioral level, at the neuro, at the neurobiological level, and at the phenomenological level. So what are these capacities? After a year of working on this, uh, I, you know, looking at a lot, a lot, a lot of what, how people think about consciousness, we came to a list that seemed to us more or less okay, sort of convincing. And it, we're talking, uh, the, the properties that I'm going to describe are overlapping, and I'm not going to go very deeply into any of them, but because this is not what, this is not the core of this lecture, this is not what the purpose of this lecture. But I want to say a few words about them. And they are, they are overlapping. And this is important because the overlap suggests that they are somehow coupled and they are part of a system, a unified system. So one of the things that people are talking about when they're talking about consciousness, they are talking about the fact that there is some kind of binding and unification. For example, we see the apple as green, as round, as smooth. We discriminate between complex holes. We see both parts and holes, and we can move from one to the other. Something very interesting. So also something that, that a lot of people say is extremely important. It's very, very central, for example, to, the, to one of the theories of consciousness, the global uh, neural, uh, the global neural workspace theory, GNW, and that's global accessibility and broadcast. And that requires multiple integration, generalization, discrimination, and so on. 
there are interactions between representations, neural representations that, that form a common kind of neural space that contextualizes and updates incoming inputs, enables comparisons, discrimination, generalization, prioritization, decision, and finally also decision making. It, it is based on some kind of back and forth interactions between this global workspace and a lot of uh, specific, specific modules. When we think, so that's one, that's another property which is, uh, that a lot of people think is very central to, to consciousness. Another thing that is very central is intentionality, aboutness, representation, it's mapping, representing the body, the world, action, prospective action, and the relations between them. People who are talking about consciousness are talking about kind of temporal depth, Consci the, the present is not an infinitely small uh, point of intersection between uh, future and, and past. It is, it has duration. So there's some kind of integration through time. There's working memory. There's something that uh, William James called the spacious present. There are also ongoing selection processes in the nervous system that constitute this process, exploration, stabilization processes. Consciousness, again, James said, and many others said, is, is a selective agent. There are developmental selection processes that include selective attention and active exclusion, all kinds of attention skills that are very much part of what we think about when we think about consciousness. When we think about consciousness, we also think about evaluation, about the ability to evaluate things as good and bad, and that it is a flexible thing, this ability to evaluate. We can prioritize actions according to goals and past and present physiological context and needs. And this is based on learned representations of all kinds of predictive relations. And we think about agency in the way that I defined it. It's, it's the, about proactivity, about inherent goal-directed activity. Goal-directed activity is very, very important. And we think when, and when most people think about consciousness, not everyone, I mean, there are people that think about disembodied consciousness. Being a biologist, I don't understand what they're talking about, but uh, most biologists think about some kind of embodiment. Uh, and not just any embodiment, but embodiment that enables many degrees of freedom of movement and open-ended ability for self-learning. And when we think about consciousness, we think about the self, about a registration of self-other uh, perspective and a stable perspective, a sense of body ownership, a kind of ego sense. I think that if we found some creature or some being somewhere with these properties, we would be careful about it. I mean, we would think, may, well, maybe it is conscious, maybe we should not hurt it. So let's go to the marker. Can we find a marker? Again, we were looking for more than a year, actually, a little bit more than a year for something that could work as a, as a evolutionary transition marker, something that requires that all these properties that I talked about are in place. And we tried everything. I mean, we went, <laughs> we looked at genes, we looked at proteins, we looked at uh, anatomical structures. We didn't know what to look to, we, nothing worked. We didn't know how to think about it. And then some kind of penny dropped for us. I don't know if it will drop for you, but for us it did drop. And we, and we found something that worked for the list that we have compiled, that we have compiled independently of this marker, by the way. And this is a, a mode of associative learning, which we called unlimited associative learning. Like we had unlimited heredity, now we have something unlimited associative learning, and it is the ability to learn in a very open-ended way during ontogeny. Not during phylogeny, like open-ended uh, uh, heredity, but during uh, ontology. And this kind of learning, we can actually operationalize it. It allows us very good discrimination. We can, we can dis it, 
a per, uh, an animal uh, being that can learn in this way can distinguish about, uh, among the novel compound patterns of stimuli and action, can discriminate between, for example, between more and less desirable mates, learn different routes leading to food and shelter and so on. And the land patterns are genuinely novel. They were not reflex elicit, they're not reflex eliciting patterns and they were not learned in the past. The second thing, uh, so this is uh, one thing that uh, a, a creature with this unlimited associative learning, which for short we call, uh, we call UAL, can do. So the second thing it can do, it can learn even if there is a, a time gap between the neutral complex predictive stimulus and the reinforcement. The reinforcement is the reward or punishment. So this is called trace conditioning in psychology. And uh, this means that, you know, if, if you have something that predicts a reward, this, predict, this thing that predicts the reward can happen not uh, at the same time as the reward, and it doesn't have to overlap it. It can happen a few seconds or even few minutes before the reward. And yet you can learn it and you can know, and you can learn that this is, that once you, uh, that once you perceive this, or once you do a particular action, then a reward or a punishment will follow. So this ability to learn through trace conditioning is also something necessary. It requires that memory of the neutral predictor stimulus is stored somehow, even when the reinforcing stimulus is transiently not, not perceived. The third thing that an animal like that can, or that a creature like that can do, should, uh, uh, has to do, is that it has to be able to change the value of whatever it learns. Something can be good in one environment, bad in another environment, better in one, in a, a third environment, slightly worse in yet another environment. You have to prioritize and prioritize things and flexibly change the, the, uh, change the value that you give them. It cannot be fixed. So unlimited associative learning also, and it also, uh, uh, allow enables this ability with the other abilities enable goal directed behavior which is based on belief about the about incentives that something is good something is bad and uh, an animal like that has to manifest second order learning that is it can learn that a new complex image or a new pattern of action uh, on the basis of what has been learned before so there can be some kind of cumulative learning that is based on past learning and so on. So allowing uh, organisms to build, uh, to build up chains of associative links, to categorize things, to transfer from one modality uh, information, uh, transfer knowledge from one modality to another and so on. An animal that can do this has all the properties that I have listed before. So uh, here is the same diagram. So here we have the list of capacities. The transition mark is an un unlimited associative learning. And we say that it marks the transition to this list. And this list is sufficient. If, if this list is sufficient to, uh, as, uh, to characterize the conscious mode of being, then unlimited associative learning marks the presence of a uh, conscious life. Now, why is it? that we say that unlimited associative learning is really a good marker. It is open-ended, it is generative, it is value flexible, it is recursive, and it is representational, right? This were the, basically the things I was talking about. It allows integration of sensory features to form compound configuration of world, body, action, and uh, their relations. It requires hierarchical and recurrent mapping of world body and action generating stimuli into representations of world body and prospective actions. It requires exclusion of irrelevant signs and, and it requires focusing mechanisms. It requires that there is dedicated memory system that stores representations, not, of, not just of parts, but of wholes as well as parts. It requires that there is an evaluation system that can assign balance to any compound input configuration and that enables uh, context sensitive prioritization. 
So we can learn the value of action outcome and of outcome value. This kind of relations can be represented and can be learned. I mean, can be learned and it can be represented. And there is an ability, a, a creature that can do, that can learn in the, in the unlimited associate, uh, as in an unlimited associative way, has the ability to distinguish between body generated and world generated stimuli. And the ability, and it has the ability to distinguish between learned action outcome contingency and identical outcomes that are independent of one's learned action. So there are, this, this are very, very important kind of qualities. And these are qualities that uh, correspond to the way that people think about, it. when they think about consciousness, they think that the conscious creatures should be able to do this kind of things. Now, the next stage was to think about some kind of simple model, not of consciousness, not of minimal consciousness, but of unlimited associative learning, because the dynamics of unlimited associative learning, we argued, would tell us something about the dynamics of consciousness. They're not the same. The dynamics of consciousness are more demanding, but they will tell us something. So what does it, so what do we have to have in order to have this kind of unlimited associative uh, learning? We have to have relations between, uh, between integrative sensory units, units that integrate sensory information, and there are many types of sensory information, units that integrate motor information, information about movement. Uh, uh, we, we need to have an integrative, uh, an integrative unit for memory or units for memory that integrate, that that where we remember not just parts, but holes and events and scenes. It's kind of declarative memory system that we need here. And we need uh, an integrative reinforcement unit. And all this have to come together and talk to each other. That's why we have double, arrowed, uh, double arrows there. And come together and go back to these units. And through this dynamics, we have something. Uh, this is the dynamics of UAN. And we believe that it is something that is essential and central for minimal consciousness. And there are lots of things that are not here. I mean, it's a very, very, very primitive little scheme. Doesn't show us all the hierarchical levels that are involved. Doesn't show us many, many, many important things. Uh, but it doesn't show us the levels of memory that we must have at each, uh, for example, not only synaptic memory, but also uh, nuclear memory, uh, epigenetic memory. Uh, so it doesn't tell us a lot of things, but it gives us a kind of idea of the kind of architecture and the kind of uh, of the kind of units that we should be looking for if we want to understand what 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 kind of organ or organs can implement this kind of uh, of uh, unlimited associative learning and by uh, by implication also minimal minimal consciousness. So what we're saying is basically that. The architecture of URL, since it allows organisms to integrate spatial and temporal information, map or represent relations between the world cues and actions and outcomes from a stable point of view, it can allow us up to update representation and evaluations according to currently incoming inputs, evaluative inputs. It allows us to discriminate between different patterns of percepts between different patterns of actions, between different outcomes. It allows us to generalize and flexibly transfer what is learned from one domain to another. It can direct shift and sustain, it allows us to direct shift and sustain attention. And it assign values to different representation of the world, of the actions of the body, according to past representation. So it, what, what it means, and importantly, this comes to the possibility, to the ability of unlimited associative learning, enabling us, enabling goal-directed behaviors that are driven by beliefs and desires that involve recognition of predictive relations between sensory inputs, action, and outcome, and that satisfy relevant physiological needs that are, that are prioritized 
all the time priorities and update it. Now, this kind of learning is found in three groups so far. Invertebrates, almost all of them, in some arthropods, and in the coleoid cephalopods. And the first group, the vertebrates and the arthropods, first emerged with the supporting brain structures during the Cambrian explosion, like 542 million years ago. And the coleoid cephalopods appeared uh, on the planet like 250 million years later. And all these kinds of organism, all this uh, phyla, all the, the individuals in this phyla, have the supportive uh, brain structures. So they have the sensory integrating units, the motor integrating units, the declarative memory units, the, or something like that. Of course, it's not organized in the same way. They're totally different in the three phyla, but some, and we know more about, uh, most about vertebrates. We know something quite not bad about the, the, uh, the arthropods, not very good, but, and we know least about the cephalopods, but we know something enough to say that they probably have all this supportive brain, brain structures. Okay. So we suggest, so, okay, so, so this is the story. So we have now an idea of the, of the if, you, if you buy this story, if you buy into this kind of approach and into this kind of analysis, and I gave you a very, very brief caricature of, uh, of our of, of this model, then you know what kind of processes constitute unlimited associative learning. And since it is a marker of consciousness, it is also something that can tell us about consciousness. So, and since it al allows us to have goal-oriented kind of goal-directed uh, goal behaviors, that are based on representations of action outcome and outcome value and the, and the, and the sensory predictors, complex sensory predictors that are perceived as holes and with parts. The function of consciousness, we can say, sorry, is the generation of a new realm of goals that are guided by beliefs, the, action outcome representation and desires the outcome value representation and these are anchored in physiological needs the, this enables the organism to make context dependent decisions and reach goals that are based on these representations and interestingly this kind of approach is very much in line with the approach of uh, two very important psychologists, Dickinson and Balain, who looked at it from a behaviorist point of view, but came, but identified this, uh, the functions of consciousness as the ability for goal-directed behavior that allows this kind of representations. And it also is in line with what William James suggested he said that consciousness is a fighter for ends of which many, but for its presence would not be ends at all. And he also said the following, one cannot compete with the paraphrase James he wrote so beautifully. He said, now the study of the phenomenon of consciousness, which we shall make throughout the rest of this book, this is the principles of psychology, will show us that consciousness is at all times primarily a selecting agency. Whether we take it in the lowest sphere of uh, the in the in the in the lowest sphere of sense or in the highest uh, intellection, we find it always doing one thing, choosing one out of several of the materials so presented to its notice, emphasizing, accentuating that, and suppressing as far as possible all the rest. The item emphasized is always in close connection with some interest felt by consciousness to be paramount, paramount at the time. I think it's very, very close to, which, to what we, we say and what Dickinson and Belain say in many, uh, and uh, that this is a good way of thinking about consciousness as opening up 
a new realm of goals that didn't exist before. These are goals that are driven by, mental, by something that we call mental states, something like this type of representations that require this very complex kind of capacities that I have listed uh, previously. Now, so we can think about consciousness as, as that the function of consciousness is opening a, a realm of, of goal, a new realm of goals. But maybe it is more coherent to think about consciousness, about the conscious mode of being in terms of new kind of goal directedness rather than in terms of functions. I think, I think it is easier to think in this way. So we can think that consciousness can be construed as an open-ended neural selection process that is driven by felt needs. And it is a kind of evolutionary process, evolutionary process in the body and the brain, mainly in the neuro, uh, neural kind of selection evolution, which is like all open-ended evolutionary process has something that we call purposefulness without purpose. And that's a term that was invented by Kant to describe aesthetic judgment. And every evolutionary process is really open-ended because it doesn't necessarily lead to anything. It has purposefulness, yes, because it is a selection, there is selection involved, but the particular purpose is uh, contingent. It, 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 uh, it depends on circumstances. We cannot decide a priori, and it's important that we cannot decide a priori what the purpose is, but the purposefulness is there. And, and I think that like the, 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 the processes in the nervous system are of this kind too. So I would finish just with something that is a kind of, sorry, a, a kind of, a, a kind of comparative thing going back to the modes of being that Aristotle described, the living mode of being, the subjective experiencing, the symbol based. The living was his nutritive reproductive soul, the subjective experiencing was a sensitive soul, and the symbol based is the reflective. I didn't talk much about the symbol, uh, the symbol based. So we can think about the telos, the goal of these things. And here in the living, it will be self-maintenance and reproduction. In the subjective case, in the sensitive soul, it will be the satisfaction of felt needs. And in, for the symbol base, it will be the satisfaction of abstract negative uh, regulative ideas. And the values here with will be phylogenetic. Fitness is used to measure differential survival and reproduction. Ontogenetic for the subjective experiencing, affective states will be the values that will give the weight to one goal or the other. And in the symbol-based case, it will be historical and it will be the cultural symbolic uh, norms that will be the values. The organizing sim uh, principle, and remember that everything is uh, sort of hierarchically nested. For the living, it's function. For the subjective experiencing, it's qualia, mental representations, both also functions also men, but specifically it will be mental representation and specific to the symbol based will be symbolic uh, symbolic meta mental representations abstract values and concepts the internal default plasticity remember that we defined agency in terms of not only of goal directed behavior but also of, uh, in terms of plasticity there must be there is a very very important kind of internal exploration, stabilization processes that are the necessary background for any adaptive plasticity. We call them vivaciousness in living, something that happens within the biochemical networks in the cell. Consciousness, the conscious kind of uh, networks like the default network that we see in mammals, for example, and reflectiveness, which is also a default uh, kind of network in the brain, which has uh, additional properties and is also, and in the case of humans, because of the shared symbolical values, it is also going in, into the network of interactions between humans. Heredity, 
is unlimited for the living. We have unlimited memory and learning in the, in the subjective experiencing case, and we have unlimited cultural variation in the case of symbolic based reflective models. The selecting principle will be open ended natural selection for the living, open ended exploration and selective stabilization during ontogeny for the subjective experiencing one, the sensitive soul, and open ended cultural symbolic based selection for the reflective case. The evolutionary transition here will be to living, subjective experiencing, and to symbolizing rationalizing. And the evolutionary transition marker in the case of living is unlimited heredity, as suggested by Gandhi and Maynard Smith, unlimited associative learning, as we suggested, and unlimited symbolizing. I think a lot of people would agree with that, although it was not phrased in this way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eva. That was um, that was really great. Um, we normally take a couple of minute break if that's okay with you, just so people can um, have a think about questions, get a glass of water, etc. Yeah, it's really um, a good idea for me too. Yeah. So um, if we regroup, say at five past six our time, uh, so five minutes in three minutes. Yeah, yeah, five minutes is great. I'll have make myself a cup of tea. Great, great. Okay, I'll see you.